Hello? Hello? <clears throat> Podcast Network Asia. Network Asia. This episode may include topics, references, or discussions around sexual assault, domestic violence, stalking, physical violence, or subject matters that may be disturbing to some of our listeners. We do acknowledge that this content may be difficult. We also encourage you to care for your safety and well-being. Shocking, sad, revealing, and deeply researched, PH Murder Stories podcast covers the true account of infamous killings and true crime stories from the Philippines. There's no such thing as questions, just hidden answers. Stay tuned as we revisit the inconceivable crimes that exist. Some listeners may find the following content of PH Murder Stories highly disturbing due to its graphic nature. PH Murder Stories does not condone nor promote violence of all sorts. Viewer discretion is advised. At midnight of July 18, 2002, a 32-year-old British businessman was found murdered at his apartment in Makati City, Metro Manila. For years, the case would go unsolved, while his mother battled to piece together the clues to his death. Exhausting every ounce of time, effort, and money she had, her life became consumed in trying to figure out who had killed her son. Stephen Alston Davis grew up in Nottingham, located in the middle part of England, north of London. His father died when he was 14 years of age, leaving him with his mother, Margaret, and two younger sisters. By the age of 21, Stephen started his internet company's journey in Hong Kong, which at the time was a former colony of the United Kingdom. Later on, he went to the Philippines for a vacation, where he met the love of his life. Stephen met Evelyn Bohol, a local dancer and sex worker at a club in Angeles City, Pampanga. Evelyn was only 17 years old at the time. However, she lied and claimed that she was already 21 years of age. Angeles City is known to be a red light district or the sex capital of the Philippines. Foreigners in the country looking for a good time at night, are being referred there to see local women dancing and offering sexual favors in various bars. According to Stephen's friends, he was known for his kindness and generosity. He paid 500 British pounds to Evelyn to encourage her to quit her job as a dancer and prostitute. Stephen eventually started a relationship with Evelyn They got married in Hong Kong sometime in March of 1997. After their small wedding, Stephen moved to the Philippines to create a future with Evelyn, where they have two children, a daughter and a son. Stephen bought a house in Angeles City so Evelyn could still be near her family. As Stephen's Jade Cool Internet Management grew, his schedule became hectic. His company's main office was located in Makati City, the country's premier financial hub, three to four hours away from their house in Pampanga. To fix his living situation, Stephen decided to rent an apartment in Makati City, together with his business partner, friend, and roommate, Martin Dunn. He would stay there on the weekdays, while he would go home to spend time with his family on the weekends. Evelyn and her two children were well provided for by Stephen. He was earning 60,000 pounds annually from his job, which was more than enough to raise a family in the Philippines during that time. 
According to Margaret, Stephen's mother, her son provided Evelyn with weekly allowances, including their children's tuition fees. Margaret had also invested some of her money in Stephen's company when it started, making her a significant shareholder. Margaret was very close to her son, partly because of her husband's loss. But she also described Stephen as a naturally loving and friendly human being. When Stephen and Evelyn got married quickly, Margaret became skeptical about her son's wife. She and her second husband initially felt uncomfortable with Evelyn, although they eventually grew to care about her and often visited to see the grandkids and the happy couple. Everyone in Stephen's family thought he had a fun relationship with Evelyn. Unfortunately, it was not the case. Their marriage was not as perfect as others thought it would be. Bills became overlooked, the money went missing, and Stephen spent extended periods away from his family, partying with his work friends instead. During the last few months of Stephen's life, Evelyn began acting strangely. She often left the house, withheld affection, and was always on her phone. Stephen's mother suspected she was seeing someone on the side. Sure enough, Evelyn had confided in her sister about having an affair with a security guard named Arnold Adorai. Stephen realized that his wife was up to something when he took his daughter to school one day but was shocked to learn that she was not enrolled there. Evelyn had spent the money meant for their daughter's education on her boyfriend and herself. Stephen also told his mother about Evelyn pawning his wedding ring, then eventually demanded her to get a job or attend college, threatening that he would no longer give her money and split up with her. Shortly after finding out about Evelyn's ungrateful acts, Stephen got murdered inside his apartment in Makati City. His flatmate, Martin, together with his girlfriend, Jennifer, witnessed the crime. At around 2 o'clock in the morning, Jennifer told Martin that a person seemed to be lurking around and flashing a light outside their room. Suspecting that the person outside the room was Steven and that he was trying to play a practical joke on them, Martin asked, What are you doing tonight? Instead of Stephen answering back, three men with drawn handguns suddenly entered their room. A gunman, whose gun was aimed at Martin, asked, Is this him? After that, the other gunman grabbed Jennifer by the hand and locked her inside Martin's bathroom. After taking Martin's keys, wallet, and cellular phone, the three men proceeded to Stephen's room. Upon seeing Stephen, who was deeply asleep, the killer fired four consecutive shots, hitting Stephen's back. The three men then hurriedly left the house. After he was sure that the gunmen were no longer inside the apartment, Martin immediately went to Stephen's room. There, he saw the lifeless body of Stephen. After checking Stephen's pulse, Martin administered CPR on Stephen. But he no longer responded. Hi, ako si Earl, ang inyong Camp Master sa Philippine Campfire Stories Podcast. This podcast is about stories of myths, legends, and true horror stories from the Philippines narrated in Tagalog, powered by Podcast Network Asia. Listen to Philippine Campfire Stories available in all major podcast platforms.
In an effort to inform Stephen's wife of what happened, Martin made numerous attempts to reach Evelyn through her phone immediately after the incident. Finally, he was able to contact her through her mobile phone at around 6 o'clock in the morning. The former quickly informed the latter of the killing of her husband. When Martin met Evelyn at 10 o'clock in the morning, he readily observed that she showed no signs of sadness despite the violent death of her husband. Meanwhile, Margaret Davis found out that her son had been killed when she received a phone call from Martin that Stephen got in an accident. When Martin called Margaret back and filled her in on the details, she jumped into action right away and got on a plane to the Philippines. Those two phone calls were not from the foreign office or the police. She never heard the news officially from anyone. They were not even from Stephen's wife, Evelyn, with whom he had a baby son and young daughter. Instead, the calls were from her son's best friend, Martin, who had been asleep in the next room to Stephen when he had been murdered. But Margaret Davis did not fall apart that night. Instead, within minutes of receiving the second call, she told her second husband, Alan, who had become Stephen's stepfather, that they were going to the Philippines to bring their son home. It was the beginning of a journey wherein Margaret would put herself in a complicated situation. Challenging the law in Britain and the Philippines, dealing with incompetent and corrupt officials, hiring her private investigators, being accused of her grandchildren's abduction, and culminating in several trials for the murder of her son, Stephen Davis. In the first week of her son's death, Margaret spent time with Stephen's wife, Evelyn, and their two children. But it wasn't long before she started to get a bit suspicious. Things were not happening for several weeks. Then, the police that came up with suspects for the murder had put surveillance at Stephen's house. One was Evelyn's brother-in-law, and the other was her boyfriend. Margaret suspected her daughter-in-law's involvement and had a bad feeling about Evelyn's boyfriend. The police, however, would not investigate Evelyn, letting the case go cold. This led to Margaret moving temporarily to the Philippines to advance the investigation herself. Margaret's search for justice came at a substantial cost. She not only had to pay for a private investigator, but also travel costs between Britain and the Philippines, legal representatives, and her grandchildren's passports. Plus, she had to give gas money to the Filipino police if she requested them to question a suspect. The British government certainly did not help. Indeed, Her Majesty's ambassador to the Philippines even suggested that Margaret go home and leave her son's investigation to the authorities. She ended up having to mortgage her house, nearly depleting her savings. She also sent money to Evelyn's relatives, who provided information to prove Evelyn's guilt. As police began investigating Stephen Davis's death, they moved slowly. They thought the killer was someone related to his business, perhaps a co-worker or rival. But this theory turned up nothing and did not answer important questions. Was it robbery or business-related? Why did they only kill Stephen, but not Martin? After all, Martin was sleeping in the next room and even saw the assailants. 
rather than commiserating with the woman who had just lost her son. Stephen's widow immediately asked Margaret for money. Later on, Margaret heard from the couple's friends that Evelyn often entertained many male friends at their home in Angeles City. While her husband was away during weekdays working in Makati City, Feeling outraged and just hours before her son's funeral, Margaret confided her suspicions about Evelyn to the police. She told them that Evelyn had been stealing money from her son. The killers were given a key to get into his apartment in Makati City, and no one could contact Evelyn in the hours after his death, and that she never called after his murder. Furthermore, Evelyn even said the gunman had been in the house for 20 minutes when there was no way she could have known that fact. However, the police dismissed Margaret's claims, insisting that the murder had been a robbery gone wrong. Undeterred, Margaret set out to prove that her daughter-in-law had hired her son's killers and that they had been paid with Stephen's own money. When Margaret saw Evelyn at her son's funeral, she demanded her daughter-in-law to swear that she had nothing to do with her son's death. The young woman screamed that she did not have her husband killed, sinking to the floor in tears. Margaret was desperately concerned about her two grandchildren who were still under Evelyn's care. Margaret then decided to take them back with her to Nottingham, at least for a holiday. While she was negotiating with the British consul to get the children's passports and exit visas, which was not officially possible without their mother's permission, the Philippine police suddenly arrested Arnold Adoray and a security guard named Alex Dagami. Both men were charged with the murder of Stephen Davis. Meanwhile, the British Embassy rushed both Margaret and granddaughter Jessica out of the Philippines. However, Margaret's grandson, Joshua, was with Evelyn's family in Angela City, concerned that their lives were in danger because of a possible revenge plot from associates of Adorai and the Gami. In September 2002, six weeks after Stephen's death, Margaret left the Philippines. In Nottingham, she tried to rebuild her life, but her son's death and her certainty of her daughter-in-law's role in his murder became an ever greater obsession. Furthermore, Margaret also wanted to reclaim her grandson, Joshua. Her private investigators went to Evelyn's hometown and offered her father, Marceleno Bohol, 200 British pounds to give Joshua in return. Joshua was staying with Evelyn's parents. Margaret sent her investigator to the island with an offer of 200 pounds to hand him over. I cried. I cried over the child. He was going far away. But I couldn't do anything because I don't have the money for his schooling. Whatever he wants to study, it's better if he is with the other grandmother, Margaret. She has plenty of money. There he can study and choose whatever course he wants and finish his education. A few months later, Joshua was reunited with his grandmother. Little did Evelyn know that she will never see her children ever again. I hug my, my daughter and give her love. And I'm never gonna say again. I'm never gonna say it again. The laugh of my kids, I mean, she knows that I love my kids. She knows and that my life, it was just my kids and my husband, she knows that. 
Evelyn attempted to take her revenge. She charged her mother-in-law with abducting her children, which meant that Margaret could be arrested if she returned to the Philippines. Margaret, at the time, felt that she was falling apart. She took out other loans to sustain her campaign to get justice for her son. She was refused help from the state beyond child benefit and guardian's allowance. Social services insisted that she did not qualify for any other financial support. Meanwhile, authorities in the Philippines finally acted when faced with evidence from the private investigation. They took into custody three men, Arnold Adorai, Robin Butas, and Alexander Dagami. The court found all of them guilty of the killing and other related offenses. The killers faced a prison sentence, except for Butas, who helped the police with the investigation as a state witness. One of the men was Evelyn's boyfriend, Arnold Adorai, which enhanced Margaret's theory about her daughter-in-law's involvement with her son's death. She noted that Evelyn had not cried at the funeral and did not appear surprised to learn about her husband's untimely death. Margaret and her husband, Alan, also recalled how Evelyn had encouraged them to say goodbye to their son when they last visited him. While her son's shooters were in prison, Margaret remained dissatisfied. She still believed that Evelyn was either the mastermind behind her son's death or somehow involved. Evelyn's family agreed, helping Davis with her research. One of the men who broke into the apartment, Robin Butas, said he was willing to give details about what happened in exchange for leniency. According to Butas, Evelyn had not only planned the whole thing, but was also waiting in the car as the men rushed in to kill Stephen Davis. He said, Evelyn told them about the apartment and gave them the keys. With this testimony, Margaret knew that she could finally obtain justice for her son. Evelyn had gone into hiding, but the police found her and arrested her for the killing of Stephen. While the three men were on trial for the shooting, Margaret couldn't shake the idea that Evelyn was involved as well. Eventually, Buta spoke up and Margaret learned that she was right. According to Margaret, quote, I ached for my poor and betrayed son, but the knowledge of her evil doing gave me strength to fight on. Unquote. In February 2004, more than 18 months after her son's killing, the two men charged with his murder, Adorai and Tagami, were tried, found guilty, and sentenced to 30 years each without remission. Then, just a few days later, Margaret's determination bore fruit. In a remote province of the Philippines, Evelyn was arrested where she had been in hiding and brought back to face a murder trial. In 2004, a court found Evelyn guilty of conspiring with her boyfriend and two others in the slaying of Stephen Davis. She met a prison sentence of 40 years without the possibility of parole. She avoided the death penalty but received the maximum sentence. This is shown this positive portion. Wherefore, this court hereby finds Evelyn Bohol Italawagan, also known as Evelyn Bohol, 
Evelyn Bohol Davis and Dianita Bohol Davis, guilty beyond reasonable doubt of murder, qualified by treachery without any mitigating or aggravating circumstances, and sentences her to suffer the penalty of reclusion perpetua. Together Evelyn has been spared the death penalty, but she's got the maximum life sentence. That means 40 years in prison, with no possibility of an early release. All right. Any more case? The court. Uh, were you satisfied that she was just given a resolution perpetua? I don't get any pleasure in seeing my daughter-in-law going to prison. Mm -hmm. And no matter what happens, it would never bring my son back. But there's no pleasure in seeing Evelyn go to prison. None at all. Margaret has one last task before she leaves. She's going to confront Evelyn with her crimes and say goodbye. Does she want to talk? Okay. Stand up, Evelyn. Stand up and talk to me, Evelyn. <coughs> Take off those glasses. Look at me. Your daughter cries for you. Your son cries for you. They want their mummy. And you don't want them. I want Jesse and Joshua, you, you know that. You do want them. No, you know that. I want Jesse and Joshua, you know that. But how, how, can you, how can you convince me of that? Whatever happened with Stephen, I don't know. You know that, Mum. I was there with Stephen. Everything what happened with Stephen, when he's dead, I was there. And I go to the hospital when I know when someone called me and I was crying. But your boyfriend, it was your boyfriend. I don't never get, I, I, I don't I never have a relationship with him. Even if I die now. I have a perfect love, I have beautiful Jessica and I have beautiful Joshua in my life. <laughs> Why am I alive? Stephen is the best man in my life. You. He loved you, your children loved you, and look what's happened. I don't have that anything to Steve. If my daddy knows what is happening to her, right? Evelyn continues to deny everything. In 2006, Margaret Davis released a book called For the Love of My Son which documented her experiences in solving her son's murder. Up to this day, Evelyn denies her involvement in the murder of her husband. Her camp, later on, filed for an appeal, but was dismissed. For further updates, please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at PH Murder Stories. And subscribe to our YouTube channel, PH Murder Stories. If you have case suggestions, please go to our website at phmurderstories.com and fill out the request form at File Your Blotter. Did you like this episode? Give us a rating on Apple Podcasts, or if you're listening on other platforms, kindly send us a review on our Facebook page or send us a tweet. You can also share our podcast to your Instagram and Facebook stories through Spotify. We're also inviting you to join our Facebook group, PH Murder Stories The Verdict, and participate in our discourse about true crime, both local and international. This group is a safe space for true crime and mystery fans like us who want to engage in thorough discussions about the subject. To all our listeners, we hope you could support us on Patreon. If you're fond of online shopping, you can also help our team earn a small commission by clicking our Lazada and Shopee affiliate links found in the description. Any amount you contribute will enormously help support our team to produce more quality content.
The views and opinions expressed by the podcast creators, hosts, and guests do not necessarily reflect the official policy and position of Podcast Network Asia, the hosts of the program, or other programs of the network. Any content provided by the people on the podcast are of their own opinion and are not intended to malign any religion, ethnic group, club, organization, company, individual, or anyone or anything. <laughs>